course, I uh, told you to be finding Joel chapter 2. That's both good places in God's Word. Um, but I want to say, you know, Tuesdays to me are, are very special. Um, because whenever I, I, I look around and I see uh, the folks who have took, took the time and took the effort uh, to be here in God's house on a night like tonight just to, to dig into the Word, you see that this is, the, that this is the, the essence of what the church is. That, that you, have, you have said to yourself that the Word of God is important enough that you want to know something deeper about God's Word. Now, you know, Sundays are, are, are wonderful, and Sunday is my favorite time of the week. But I'm going to tell you, as far as being in God's house and really digging into God's Word, nothing takes the place of these great Bible studies that we're able, of course, to uh, dig in. And I want to thank you for being here, and I praise the Lord for each and every one of you. Um, Acts chapter 2, what we're going to be reading here in just a moment, but... Um, just to kind of lay just a, a, a quick foundation before we jump in and remind you of a couple of, of key parts to this. Remember, all of this has taken place in Acts chapter 2. The Bible said when Pentecost had fully come, had fully come. And what that meant to us whenever we went back and we dug back into Leviticus 23 and we reviewed those feasts of God's uh, 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 timetable, so to speak, and we saw that, of course, Jesus, he, he fulfilled. This was all a perfect picture prophecy, that he fulfilled Passover whenever he was the ultimate Passover lamb that was offered on the cross of Calvary on Passover. He never allowed himself to be offered and crucified until Passover had happened. Well, then, of course, he was the perfect picture, I told you, that he was the first fruits of the resurrection whenever he rose up on first fruits, fulfilling that great prophecy of God's word uh, whenever he did. So it was, only, it was only perfection that it had to happen now that the church would be born the next feast, which is the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot, or also called uh, uh, Pentecost. And I told you that, of course, being 50 days, penta 50 days. But if you remember, I told you that, that, that this was to symbolize the harvest of the wheat harvest. That they would take a little bit of wheat over here, a little bit of wheat over here, and they would collect the, 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 the first fruits of the wheat harvest, and they would bring it all together. And that first fruits, of course, being a, 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 an indication as to how the whole harvest was going to be. If the first fruits was good, then you know the rest of the harvest was going to be good. So they took that, that, that little bit of wheat from all these different areas and they compiled it into two loaves. Two loaves. And I told you that was good. But I, I never really dug into it because it wasn't time yet. I didn't want to give you too much. But it was those two loaves symbolizing what would be the church. And those two loaves being Jew and Gentile, that it was now combined in, in, into one grouping, into one harvest called Pentecost, and it was also very important that this was the only offering, this was the only feast that had leaven in it. And leaven, of course, being symbolic of, of what puffs up, that sinful thing in, in, in us that puffs it up. So, so the, the, the barley harvest on Passover, that was without leaven. And of course, that was perfect, uh, a, a perfect symbol of Jesus because we know that He had no sin. But yet He became sin for us. So therefore, He had no sin on His own. So that offering had no leaven. It had no sin. But we know that without a doubt, the church is far from being sinless. We know that the church is far from being perfect. But the only perfection that we can boast of is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we have now put on. Amen? So therefore, this is a perfect uh, uh, picture and symbol of what this means. So understand that no longer that we, that we are what we were, but now we have been made part of something that is much bigger than what you are. For instance, that, that, that wheat that was baked into those loaves. 
No longer could you ever go back in. If this right here don't bless your heart, I, I, I can't help you. No longer can you go back into those loaves and pull out those grains of wheat. It has, now, it has now been formulated into something that is completely different than what it was to begin with. You, see, you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. So now, there's no way, since you are a new creation, there's no way for you to go back and pull out the old Harvey Arrington because he don't exist no more. He's been baked into the loaf and now he is a part of the body of Christ. Do you see this? So that if, if, if that's not enough to make you understand how sealed you are in Jesus Christ and how, and how eternally secure that you are, then I can't help you anymore. Because no longer can you pull it out because you're different. You've been made into a completely different creation. Okay? So it's, it's perfect. The Spirit of God, understand what's happened up to this point. The Spirit of God has set the stage. The whole Pentecost scene... The whole cloven tongues, the, 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 the whole uh, uh, speaking in other languages, it's all set the stage perfectly and now they're, they, are, they have been brought together. I told you last week that they were confused. Their, their minds have, have completely been boggled and it was time now for somebody to come along and eliminate that confusion. And how do we eliminate confusion? The preaching of God's Word. The preaching of God's Word eliminates the preaching of the cross all the way through the, the, the book of Acts, through the, the epistles of the apostles, even today should follow the pattern of what we see here and what we're going to look at. And that's why I've named it Principles of Preaching. Principles of Preaching. Ryan, I, I'm not a preacher. Why should I care about the principles of preaching? Yeah, but you know good preaching when you hear it. And you also know when it's bad preaching. And you also know when you ain't getting anything out of something, right? And there's a reason for that. So the Spirit has set the stage. He's got them together. He's confused them. And now, all of a sudden, they're hearing about the wonderful works of God. These, these folks, they're, they're, they're testifying of the wonderful works of God, tying this all in together. And Peter, he just slips in and starts to fire away. He slips in and starts to preach. And the Spirit of God has done all this preparation work. And I want to give you here just a little bit real quickly before we actually start to, to uh, read. I want to give you just a little bit because I want you to see it so specifically. What does it mean to truly preach? What is it there? What is preaching in terms of, of content? Preaching comes from the Word. Whenever you, whenever you actually read this, it comes from the Greek word caruso. And from caruso, what caruso means is it means to proclaim. It means to herald. It means, it, it, it means to announce a proclamation. Does it mean just to mildly say something or, or just passively go your way? It means to proclaim a truth that you're passionate about and that, and that needs to be proclaimed. So from Caruso, we get this very important word that some of you may have never heard before, but it's called the kerygma. Kerygma is the actual term of what real preaching is. It is the body of preaching. If you, were, if you, if you had went to, to seminary, if you had went to some kind of Bible college, then what they would teach you is they would teach you what's called the kerygma. And kerygma, what that means is it is the, the, the body of the content of proclamation. And what that is, is that means whenever you get up to proclaim, whenever you get up to get the body of proclamation all the way through this New Testament, it's always made up of the same thing. You ready for this? First of all, the kerygma is always centered on Jesus Christ. It's always centered on on Jesus Christ. All the way through this great book of Acts, it will involve the fact that Jesus, watch this, has fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. 
that he is the one that, that, that all of these prophets of our Old Testament have, have, have prophesied for years and years and years about he's the one that, that is to come. So it is centered on Jesus Christ and specifically how he has fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. Watch this. Second of all, it's also to the fact that it, is, it, it, it centers on the, the, the fact that Jesus was God in human form. That He was God in human form. So therefore, you have to know that, that, that how important that it was that, that divinity met humanity. That if it was not for that, then you and I would still be lost today. That therefore, there had to be the perfect God-man, just as much God as He was man, just as much man as He was God, and therefore it bridged the gap between you and I, and it reconciled us back to our Heavenly Father. But then thirdly, it centered on Jesus' life work, particularly His death and His resurrection. What did it mean when Jesus died on the cross? But better yet, what did it also mean when Jesus rose from the dead? That he, that he won the victory over death. But fourthly, watch this. It also talks about His second coming. This is all in one sermon. This is all in one sermon that, that you're getting Jesus, what His life meant, what His death meant, what His resurrection meant, and then now, guess what? He's coming again. And then, fifthly and lastly, it all ended with the fact that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. That if you're ever going to see an eternity in heaven, if you're ever going to see an eternity with the Heavenly Father, then the only way that you're going to get there is Jesus Christ. That that's it and it alone. That is the kerygma. But hold on just a minute. It gets even better. Because not only is preaching made up of, of, of the proclamation of who Jesus is, but it's also met with another word. The other word is dedicate. And this didache, what that means is that that is simply the doctrinal teaching of what we need to know about this gospel message. So it's not just proclamation, kerygma, but it's also didache. Now I want to I wanna, I wanna just dig in here just for one second because didache is where we get the word didactic from. You ever heard that word before? That you, will, that you will didact something or you will deduce something. You will, you will learn about what is happening here. That this has to do with the teaching and the reasoning of the doctor. Now why am I telling you all these technical terms? Because I want to show you what it means whenever you are, are, are taking someone or a group of people and you're not only proclaiming to them who Jesus Christ is, but the actual preaching part now is I'm going to give you content. It ain't enough just to be loud and say a bunch of words. Is that you have to have a content of teaching that you take the audience through a level of reasoning that gives them an understanding of them believing why they believe what they believe. And, if, and, and then at the end of it all, then you say, well, okay, I have given you this amount of, of, of doctrine. I have given you this teaching. Now, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or are you going to hear all the reasoning, hear all the things, and walk away still lost in your, in your, in your sinful state? So you have to take them through this thing. That's why so many times, in all the way through the, the, the book of Acts, what you will see is you will see them use this word that they were persuaded. That's a word, persuaded. And what it is, is that, I have, is that the preacher has gave you enough doctrinal teaching that you will sit there and you will think and you will reason. You will reason here as the Holy Ghost works here and then these two are going to meet up and you've got to make a decision between Holy Ghost conviction, reasoning in your brain that guess what, I've got to make a decision about this. I've got to somehow or another make a decision about and, and, and it will persuade you to either, okay, I'm going, I'm going to, to give up 
what I have submitted to my own will and my own flesh, and I'm going to fall under with humility. I'm going to fall under the sovereign hand of God and call out to Him, cry out to Him, ask Him for salvation. That is how you got saved, whether you realize it or not. It happened so quickly. Now, this is the problem, though. You ever heard uh, somebody have, have a really hard time proclaiming a gospel message? It's, it was a very loose gospel message, but somehow or another, the sermon, it never started where it began and never ended where it finished, and it was just all a bunch of mess in between. And then they said, well, okay, now I'll do something with this. And they just put it out there and said, okay. But, and, and, and see, that's why you will see them as many times as they will make emotional responses They'll be crying on Sunday and cussing on Monday. Because it never works. It never works because that they never had the reasoning here and they never had the conviction here and there was never a change that was made in that person. There was never anything that, 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 that persuaded them, that changed them. And this is the importance of a life-changing uh, 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 encounter with the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart and then the gospel message being preached. And there is something to it because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So therefore you've got to have this both, this both directional encounter if anybody is ever going to be changed. That is where we are here in Acts chapter 2. Now watch this. Let's jump into verse number 14. Verse number 14. But Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Now hold on just a minute. Nothing new for Peter. Peter is always an outspoken one. Okay? Boldness is not Peter's problem. Now ignorance may be his problem, but boldness has never been his problem. I love him. He comes out here, but this is different. This is not Peter by his own might. This is the Holy Spirit now working in Peter. This is something completely different. This is such a nice change as to what we have seen. But if you'll notice here, they're standing up. Peter's standing up with the eleven. What does that mean? Peter plus eleven, that gives us confirmation that, that Matthias has truly been absorbed into those other disciples and now he is fully a part of it. But I want, to, I want you to see something else here. Notice that it said that Peter stood. He stands. Now why is that important? Because this is the difference many times. If you remember, Jesus, whenever he would go into the synagogue and he would teach, Jesus would sit. It was the custom of, of the Jews as he, would, as he would teach, he would sit. John 8, Mark 4, Luke 5, Jesus was sitting as he was teaching. However, in Luke 4, whenever he grabs Isaiah 61 and starts to preach... Jesus is standing. It plainly says that, and Jesus stood, okay? That there is a difference here. And then watch, Peter lifted up his voice. Everybody always says, why you got to be so loud when you preach? Why you got to get so excited whenever you preach? What did I say that, that Caruso or the kerygma was? It was a proclamation. It was a lifting of your voice. It was something to get somebody's attention. It was to draw you in to the Word of God and say, guess what? This person here has got something that is necessary to say, so therefore we must listen to what it is and we must hear what he has to say. There's a lifting up. You know, they would tell you that, that, that many times if you forget what you're preaching, then all you got to do is just keep repeating the same phrase and just get a little bit louder every time that you, that you say it. You just keep repeating it and get a little bit louder. Well, there was this one old dude, he was preaching on the, on the, on the, on the rapture of, of, uh, of the Lord. And he got to that place where it said, Behold, I come quickly. And he would hit it he said, Behold, I come quickly. And he couldn't remember, and he, he couldn't remember his next point, Mike. He, got, he said, Behold, I come quickly. And he, a third time, oh, he, I couldn't get it. Behold, I come quickly. 
And about that time, he couldn't get it and he could not think of his next point and he grabbed the pulpit and he swung around and said, Behold, I come quickly. And about that time, he landed in a lady's lap right on the front row. And he said, I'm sorry, ma'am, I didn't mean to do that. And she said, I don't know why you're apologizing. You warned us four times before you did it. (laughs) So there's something about, there's something about lifting up your voice in the proper way. In the right way, understand that that I, I you know I was I was listening to this guy preach the other day, and about ten times through his sermon, he kept saying, "Now hold on, folks, this is just my opinion. This is just my opinion, and this is just what I think. You don't have to agree with it, but this is just my opinion." Well, after about the tenth time that he said that, I just shut it off because this is how that it goes. If all you're going to do is give your opinion then what you have to do is you have to go sit down somewhere and get along with God until you can rightfully stand and proclaim, thus saith the Lord, and have the confidence to put it out there because if you don't have it, honey, it's not worth listening to. Okay? So therefore, there is something about what Peter is doing here as he is proclaiming to, 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 to tell them that, hey, I've got something to tell you. I'm lifting up my voice. And what's great about this is that spirit-filled Peter is a whole lot better than plain old Peter. Plain old Peter have, would have already messed this up. But spirit-filled Peter is a whole different ballgame. Now watch verse 15. For these... Now this is his explanation here as to what they've witnessed. Because remember what, what they said. They, they criticized and they said, oh, they're just drunk on, on some, some uh, grape juice. But Peter is going to tell them what's happened. Watch in verse 15. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it but the third hour of the day. Now hold on. Peter, that's, that's a lame argument. What do you mean just because it's 9 a.m., why do we care that it's 9 a.m.? Because... It was their custom to where you would not eat nor drink anything during the first three hours of the day that belonged to prayer and fasting. Now, but but understand, it was especially the case on Sabbaths or feast days. And which day is it? It is when Pentecost had fully come. So therefore, he's telling them there's no way that we could be drunk on anything Because nobody has drank anything. You know your own customs. You know your Jewish customs. There's no way that this could have happened. So now he quickly passes that off and he tells them that I want you to see how the Holy Spirit is working in a powerful way. So he launches in, watch this, to a prophecy of the Old Testament. He goes back and gathers ammunition from the Old Testament. And of course, preaching out of the Old Testament to these Jewish people is a really genuine thing. Because why? Because that's going to get them on the same page of something that every single person in that audience... that hit, Because where, who were they? They were devout Jews. So they would have known something about God's Word. If you're, going, if you're going to be and make the way all the way to Jerusalem from all those different countries that we learned about last week, then guess what? They're going to know something about God's Word, okay? But now watch what he does in verse 16. This is important. Verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Time out. Freeze. Hold on. Because this is going to be interesting. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 is where he's going to start quoting from. Okay, now hold on, don't don't go there yet, don't go there yet, hold on. Because this is probably the most misquoted, the most misused, the most misunderstood part of this entire... Because I'm I'm going to read the whole thing that he says. Because I guarantee you, even if you're you're a, a, a light Bible student... Even if you ain't ever even been to church, but maybe a few times in your whole life, you have probably heard this set of scriptures here, and you've probably all heard them directly tied here to this Pentecost setting. And then, if you're a part of a certain group of believers, then you are, this, this is what you have used as ammunition as, as to, to go in your charismatic ways. Okay? But I need to give you some clarity on how this works, okay? Now let's read it first, starting with 17, because I'm going to tell you, if you get Joel 2 mixed up, 
and you get acts to mixed up, but I'm going to tell you, I can have you out here doing handstands on the monkey bars of La La Land singing Tutti Frutti very quickly, okay? You can be doing a lot of things here, but watch very closely at verse 17. Verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And watch, and I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, watch this. The huge mistake here that when, what, what, what a lot of people will do is they will take what Peter is telling these Jews that is coming of the Holy Spirit and they will say, okay, it's described by Joel, and therefore they will take the, the, the 120, what's happened to the 120 in the upper room, that this is specific as to what Joel has prophesied. And therefore, they will say, but that's not Peter's point. That is not Peter's point. That is not where he's going with this. And I'm going to prove it to you here. Because if we're going to know what Joel said, but from what Peter said, then how about this? We need to go back to what Joel said. But I need you to get this. No Old Testament prophet, no Old Testament prophet ever knew about the church. I need you to know that. I need you, if you remember back whenever, even, even whenever, uh, whenever Isaiah writes about Isaiah 9 and he, and he prophesies about Jesus being born. Do you remember what he said? He said, behold, a child is born. And then he goes straight. He never says nothing about a, a, a 2,000 year church age gap. He never says anything about that. He goes straight from a, behold, a child is born to then all of a sudden he says, behold, uh, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Well, what, when is that going to happen? Millennial kingdom. Okay? So he went from Bethlehem to millennial kingdom in one sentence. And there was nothing about that that Isaiah said a thing about, hold on, Jesus is going to be born, then we're going to have a 2,000 year, at least a 2,000 year gap of the church age, then we're going to have a seven year tribulation, and then we're going to have a 1,000 year millennial reign. Never said that. Whenever he saw the vision, he said, boom, Bethlehem will happen, and then boom, Jesus Christ reigning as king. You see this? Okay? The 69 or the 70 weeks of Daniel. He never saw what that little comma in that prophecy was going to be, that it was going to be a 2,000 year gap between the 69th week and the 70th week, which is tribulation. He never saw that gap. What did we, we never get the church mystery until Paul gives it to us as it's given to him by the Holy Spirit. Understand that even at this point, watch, Peter does not even have the mystery of the church. He knows something has happened. He knows that something amazing has happened and how he's going to describe it is he's centering not on what has happened, but what he's telling them is I need you to understand the Holy Spirit has come. They, this, is, this is a proclamation that the Holy Spirit has now come. Now, this is going to make a whole lot of sense here in just a moment. I had to give that to you before we, before we dig in. Now go back to Joel 2. Watch this. This is going to make a whole lot of sense if you have that, that understanding first. Now watch Joel 2 in verse 21. Let's start in verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Now time out for one second. Who is Joel addressing? Fear what? O oh, land. Who is the land? The Jews. The Jewish people. Israel. This is a, a prophecy for who? Israel. Okay, now watch. Watch verse 22. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, 
The fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Now come on down to, to 23. Be glad then, ye children of who? Zion. Zion, Zion another word for Jerusalem, okay? This is once again centered on who? Israel. Now watch. And rejoice in the Lord your God. For He hath given you, now this is so important, He hath given you the former rain moderately, and He will cause to come down for you the rain, watch this, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Time out, let me help you. In Israel, you had two different rainy seasons. You had a former rain and a latter rain, and it both centered around, watch, harvest. The first harvest, your barley harvest, and your wheat harvest, it was right after Passover that this rain would kick in and it would ripen up that wheat for the harvest time that would be about midsummer. Okay? That, that was your early, that was your early rain. Then you would have that latter rain in the season whenever you would have that, those, those late fruits in the fall for the fall feast. That's why at the Feast of Tabernacles, what they would do is that was the final harvest of the whole seasonal year that they would bring in those ripened fruits and all of the produce from Israel and that had the latter rain that would establish that. What did he say? Now hold on. Why did I tell you about Pentecost? Because all of this is symbolic of what? Harvest. Remember the two loaves, the wheat that was gathered around? It's all centered around harvest, okay? This is the whole harvest picture. And what is he saying? He's saying there's going to be a rain that's going to fall that's going to get that early harvest for the wheat to, to, and, and the barley to be ripened up. And then at the end, there's going to be another pouring out. There's going to be another rain that's going to come that's going to get that right. But this is what he said. He said, what's going to happen he said, you're going to have this rain over here, but then over here, you're going to have such rain that you're going to have both the latter rain and the former rain all together at one time because this is going to be a big harvest. Okay? Now, now stay with me because this is, going to, this is going to make a whole lot of sense here in just a moment. Now watch this. Keep in mind, Pentecost is harvest, the wheat harvest. Isn't it going to be ironic that watch verse 25 now? And the floors shall be full of what? Wheat. Verse 25, Joel 2. Or excuse me, verse 24. And the floors shall be full of what? Wheat. And the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. Now watch verse 25. And I will restore unto you the years that the locusts uh, hath eaten the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I set among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed. Now watch verse 27. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. Time out for one second before we hit 28, because this is going to be big. What is he saying? He's saying this is during a time when Israel acknowledges the Lord as their God. Israel ain't doing that right now, are they? They're still blinded. Am I correct? The shackles have not, or the scales have not fallen from their eyes. They are still blinded. Romans chapter 11 has not been completed. The fullness of the Gentiles has not occurred yet. Am I correct? If it is, we're in trouble. Because the fullness of, of the Gentiles, boom, the rapture takes place. Okay? So therefore, that's not happened yet. So keep that in mind. Now, I know this is messing with you because we've, 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 we've ran these scriptures all together and jumbled them up in one big pile and we, and we use Acts 2 and Joel 2 as, as, as this symbol of whenever the Holy Spirit just really gets poured out all over the church and everything happens. And that's not the case. Because watch what happens. Watch what happens in verse 28. And it shall come to pass, watch, 
afterwards. Somebody say afterward. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids. In those days will I pour out my Spirit. I will show wonders in heaven and the earth. Watch blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Do you see this? This is before the great and terrible day of the Lord. What is the great and terrible day of the Lord? Not the rapture. The great and terrible day of the Lord is when Jesus Christ comes back, Revelation 19, to bring judgment on the nations. If you remember our Revelation study, Revelation 19, Jesus comes back, white horse, King of kings, Lord of lords, and sets up His millennial kingdom. Do you see this? Okay? Now watch, watch, watch. Watch verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved... Is that what it said? Watch very closely. Delivered. For in Mount Calvary, Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the what? Remnant whom the Lord shall call. Understand how clear this is. Okay? Follow me here. The coming of the Lord. Not the rapture. This is not the time when the church, because why? Why would you talk about a rapture of the church when nobody has ever known about the church? Do you see this? The church was Paul specific. The rapture was Paul specific. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? So therefore, there's no indication of any church. So therefore, this is not for the church. This is not it. Remember the first part of Joel 2. The very first part of Joel chapter 2 starts off talking about an army of locusts. Okay, now hold on just a minute. Not only does it talk about an army of locusts, but it says there's going to be a northern invading army. Okay, hold on. The sky darkened, the gloomy times, the blood, the fire, the pillars of smoke. Does that ring a bell to anybody? Tribulation. Do you see what I'm saying? This is a time of tribulation, the great tribulation, the coming of Christ at the end of tribulation and to set up the millennial kingdom on earth. That is the terrible day of the Lord. That's the time when Jesus comes with His judgment. Now hold on this minute. Joel, he's addressing the children of Zion, the Jews. Who is Peter preaching to? He's preaching in Jerusalem to who? Jews. He's teaching to all the Jews. He's preaching to them to come in and to get ready because watch. So he hits them with an Old Testament prophecy about the great coming of Messiah and the time of tribulation that will precede it. And he reminds them that Joel told them that during the time of great tribulation there's going to be a unique outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He's telling them how unique is it? Well, Joel 2.23 again, notice that the first outpouring is called the former rain. The next outpouring is called the latter rain. And guess what the former rain was? The former rain that he's speaking of is what had just occurred there in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. He's saying this rain happened right now. This is what has got the whole thing started. This is what has established the church. It has been here and it has been established. But then he says there's going to be a different outpouring all the way at the end of this, which is at the time of tribulation. Why? Go back to our revelation study that we had. Our revelation study, what did I say? The greatest revival this world has ever seen will take place. Revelation chapter 6 as we see all the ones from every kindred, tongue, and nation as they have, they have gathered in front of the throne of God as they are praising Him and they are the ones that have been saved out of tribulation. The greatest revival that this world has ever seen. What does that mean? There was an outpouring at the beginning and then there's going to be a double portion at the end. Do you see this? 
Do you see how, how, how this is working? But then we get to, to the place of the wheat and the grapes. Because he said on the floor there was wheat and there was grapes. There was fat. What is the whole picture of the tribulation? The tribulation, the term, it comes from tribulum. You put the wheat on the thrashing floor. This big old board called a tribulum that had pieces of glass and stone that was embedded into that flat board was laid across that hard wheat and they would stand on it and there would be a team of ox that, that would pull that board and as that board would go across, it's called the tribulum and it would break off the hard chaff off of that wheat so it could be used. That is the point of the tribulation to break off the hard chaff off of the Jewish people so that they can see that Jesus Christ is Messiah. Do you see this? So this is how this works. And then it talks about these, these grapes. That's exactly what we saw over and over and over through Isaiah and Revelation where it talked about how that they were in a wine press. That that's what the judgment is. is. It is a pressing of the grapes. It was Jesus in, 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 in Isaiah 65 as He comes back and He's stained. He's stained with the winepress that He's trodden as He comes through because judgment has been poured out. So all of this is pictures of the judgment outpouring that's coming, the Holy Spirit outpouring that is coming. But now this is the part I want to show you that if you don't believe, if, if you can't get it in your mind that this is a prophecy for tribulation and millennial kingdom, this seals the deal right here. Because watch what it said. First of all, it said that it's going to be poured out on all flesh. Does it look like the Holy Spirit has been poured out on all flesh? If it is, we're in trouble. Okay? But now hold on this a minute. This is, this is the even bigger problem. Because whenever the kingdom begins, when the millennial kingdom begins, the only ones, if you remember, that enters into the millennial kingdom are just the ones that are saved. Watch, watch what it said. Whenever you have your sons and your daughters. Now first of all, hold on. Joel's talking to who? Your sons and your daughters. He's talking to who? The Jewish people. Your sons and your daughters, the Jewish people. Then, whenever it said in verse 32, watch what it said, the ones that are delivered from Mount Zion. We're not delivered from Mount Zion. We're delivered from Mount Calvary. Do you hear what I'm saying? We're saved in Calvary, not Zion. But then it said Jerusalem shall be, uh, shall be delivered and hath, and this is the very important part right here, the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. The remnant, the Jewish remnant, is the one that makes it all the way through the tribulation time period, and they enter into the millennial kingdom in flesh. Okay? So therefore, every one of them that walks into the millennial kingdom, the Holy Spirit is poured on them. They have the Holy Spirit on them. But this is even better. You and I are not even a part of this whole conversation. Because you and I are a separate, complete entity from this. You and I are that little special group, and this should make you shout all next week, that we are a group called the church. And in no time in biblical history has it ever been that the Holy Spirit is not on you, but the Holy Spirit is in you. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? So therefore, we have been raptured, we have been given glorified bodies, and we enter into to the millennial kingdom, not in flesh, but in glorified form. We are there in the kingdom, not as in flesh like they are, but we have a glorified body. Do you hear what I'm saying? So this does not even, you're not even in the conversation. You're not, you, if you're in Christ Jesus and you have been blessed to be a part of this great body called the church, you have been raptured, you have been a part of the, the, the your seven year tribulation has been in heaven. You have been at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You have stood at the Bema seat. You have been there, and therefore now, whenever the millennial kingdom comes, Revelation 19, when Jesus comes back to set up this kingdom, you're riding with Him. 
Golly. This is the difference between, between dividing the word of the Lord. This is how it has to look. Now, hold on this minute. Now, this is, this is, what, this is what I want to show you right here. This is what I want to show you. So whenever somebody sees this, they say, well, Ryan, why did Peter even bring this up? If, 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 he's, if he's preaching to this group and he's trying to persuade this group to be saved and be a part of the church, why did he bring it up? Okay, but hold on just a minute. What did I tell you? Peter did not have the revelation of what? The church. He's telling them to be ready. Now what he's saying this, Peter is showing them that the Spirit has come. What Joel said about the Holy Spirit coming, guess what happened, folks? He came. He came. So he said this, he said the, 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 they had no mystery of the rapture, knew nothing about the snatching away of the church. So the only thing Peter knows is this, is watch, Messiah can come back, you better be ready. Jesus can come back, you better get ready and be ready for Him to return right now. See, this is what we don't understand here. Do you realize that we have been living in the last days ever since Jesus' feet lifted off the Mount of Olives? Ever since they, they walked out there and saw Him go up and the angel said, uh, hold on just a minute, don't stand there gazing because the same Jesus went up, coming back in like manner. Ever since that happened, it's been last days. It has been last days. Because Peter did not know if Jesus was going to go up there and take a U-turn and come right back down. So the only thing he knew is to preach and to get them as ready as quickly as he possibly could get them ready. He said the Holy Spirit has now come. Now the other problem with this right here is, is that whenever you take all of this, the, the confusion that comes in, is that whenever Peter's sermon, whenever he takes it here at Pentecost, and you say that, okay, that was a total fulfillment at Acts chapter 2. Now, that's a problem. And then after that, we take Acts 2.21 and couple it with Romans 10.13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we say, oh, it's the same. Then we don't understand that everybody that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but it's talking about two different time periods. It's talking about the time period of the church that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then whenever we get to the tribulation, guess what? You call upon the name of the Lord, guess what's going to happen? You shall be saved. But at that time, it's going to be a different time period than what we now love as this great age of grace. This is a different time period. Now hold on just a minute. Whenever you take these scriptures and you mix them together and you start combining Old Testament national uh, uh, Israel prophecies with New Testament church prophecies, and then you take grace doctrines and mix it with tribulation and millennial content, folks, you have a mess on your hands. You have a mess on your hands. And pretty soon, you'll be riding the dragon with Moses while parting the floodwaters with Noah, and you'll be feeding the 5,000 with Goliath, and you'll be out on the Isle of Patmos with, with, with Paul and Abraham that the Antichrist banished you to. You'll be all mixed up. I mean, you won't know whether you're coming or you're going. And this is what's happened. Peter is plainly saying this. He's saying what you see now happening... In Acts 2, what you see is this is the beginning of the end. And what this is, is this means that the beginning of the last days has now come. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has now come. The Holy Spirit has now come. So this is why you have this living illustration of great power manifested here in Jerusalem. He said this is the initiation of power. This is it. But watch. He said it's just a foretaste. He said because the outpouring that's going to happen during that tribulation time period is going to be a double portion. It's going to be a double rain that's going to come. And not, notice, once again, Peter didn't know when Jesus was coming back. He said, Peter, come back two or three days. Or Jesus, come back two or three days. I don't know. But do you see the urgency that he's putting there? He's saying he didn't know when he's coming. He don't know how it's going to happen. He don't know how long. But understand, he said, be ready. The Holy Spirit has come. Be ready. He said, hey, listen, have you lost your fire tonight? Have you lost the urgency that you have 
to, to, to persuade somebody else to follow Jesus, to give them the gospel message, to give them that, 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 that doctrinal uh, 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 principle foundation, to help them understand and to reason where just, just, just giving them the wonderful works of the Lord that we saw last week. Have you lost that fire? Have you lost that? The power of this sermon, folks, that Peter preaches is the way that he has carried it. It has been led by the Spirit of God and it brings it right up to the fact of this one statement. You have to be saved and the only way you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. That's what he's pointing at. And now the Holy Spirit has come and he said, folks, he said the last of the last days are here. And can I tell you something? We're 2,000 years later. 2,000 years later. And you say, well, Ryan, that just means that, 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 that what Peter said was just a bunch of mess. That it's just, it's been 2,000 years. Peter said Jesus was coming, Mike, 2,000 years ago. Just a bunch of mess. Well, this is it. If you have that thought, if you have that understanding, then you've never had an encounter with the living Christ. You've never had an encounter with the Holy Spirit of God dwelling inside of you. You don't know the joy because if you could feel the life here, you know that it's, it's, it's calling out. It's yearning for the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something. Remember what he did. He put the Holy Spirit in you as a token, as a reminder that I'm not going to leave you here. I'm coming back to get you. And he's coming back quick. And he's coming back soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for how good that you are to us. Thank you, Lord, for, Lord, just your precious word, the clarity of your word, the power of your word. Lord, I ask that you would speak to hearts here abundantly. Lord, you know if there's one here among us that's lost, one that's not ready to meet you. Lord, one that knows right now that if you come, they're not ready. God, I ask that you would speak to their heart right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Convict them and save them before it's everlasting too late. Father, we love you, we uplift you, we praise you, and we thank you right now for all that's being accomplished. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Thank you for dying on the cross of Calvary for our sin. We praise you right now. In Jesus' name. Let's stand all over the place. I ask you to be mindful of the Holy Spirit. Whatever he's speaking to you, whatever he's saying, you come. and You just fall at this old-fashioned altar. Whatever that you need to pray about. We have folks that are sick, folks that are afflicted. These homes where death has come, you come and you pray. Whatever the Holy Spirit has spoke to you about, you come right on.